Hi everybody, welcome to The Mild Rumpus, coming at you live from the House of Flimsy, aka my dilapidated one-bedroom apartment here in New York City that is filled with books and noise. In my last wrap-up video, I said that February felt like it had been a year, which was really strange since it's the shortest month. This month treated me very, very well, and I have been chomping at the bit to shoot this video and share out all of the great books that I read because there were some really, really good ones. There was one stinker, which I'll talk about, but otherwise it was a month of solid three and four stars. No fives yet, but you know, I'm very greedy with my five stars. There was one that came extremely close and maybe should be, uh, but we'll get, we'll get there in a moment. My March TBR list had a really silly theme. I was inspired by, of all things, Miley Cyrus's performance of her song Flowers at the Grammys. So I was only reading books that had flowers on their cover artwork. I started the month off by reading Little Weirds by Jenny Slate. And I have to say this was the perfect book to kick things off with. Jenny Slate is a comedian. She's the mind behind Marcel the Shell with shoes on, that cute little internet clip that was turned into a movie. What a brain Jenny has. Now this is a book that definitely lives up to its name. It's a very unusual book, very much stream of consciousness. Uh, the essays are all really short, maybe two or four pages a pop. So it's not a book that you have to sit down and read cover to cover. Honestly, it's not an intellectual lift. It's, it's those random little thoughts that you have usually after midnight, after a night out, if you know what I'm saying. In the introduction of this book, Jenny Slate writes, this book is the act of pressing onward through an inner world that was dark and dismantled. She goes on to say, I love myself. I think that I am a very top quality person. And by the time you're done reading this book, so will you. If you're looking for a pick me up, if you're looking for a good chuckle, if you're looking for a peculiar perspective of the world, this is the book for you. The next two books that I read were books about gardens and they could not be more different. The first book is one that I could not wait to get my hands on. It is by far one of my most anticipated books of the year. This is coming out in June. It's The Garden Against Time in Search of a Common Paradise by Olivia Lang. Olivia Lang is an author that I absolutely love. I've read everything that she's written. She never disappoints. This is a book about uh, her time during lockdown, she purchases a new home with her husband, who's a poet, and together they are going to restore a garden that has a lot of historic significance. And in the book, she explores the role of gardens, the politics behind gardens, the history behind gardens, connections to literature, connections to uh, religious texts, artists, House of Flimsy. There is so much to unpack in this book, and I mean that in the best way possible. There's also such a, a self-awareness that Olivia has in her writing. I would say the overall theme of this book would be, what is the price of paradise? She acknowledges what a privilege it is to have this incredible garden. And she questions, okay, who am I taking away from so that I can have, which was really lacking and the next book that I'm gonna discuss. I thoroughly enjoyed this book. I highly recommend it. Even if you have zero interest in gardening, I have no interest in gardening, you're gonna walk away uh, with a little bit of knowledge and insight that you didn't have before. Pick it up when it comes out in June, you will not regret it. Coming off of that high, I followed it up with Among Flowers, A Walk in the Himalaya by Jamaica Kincaid. This is the polar opposite of Olivia Lang's book. Take a look at the tabs. All of these red tabs are cringy and problematic areas in the book. This was the first book that I ever read by Jamaica Kincaid. I don't know Jamaica Kincaid. I don't know anything about her. And after reading this book, I don't want to. The self-awareness that I discussed in that last book is completely lacking in Among Flowers. And it's fascinating to me that two books on the surface level, if you were to read the synopsis, you would say, ah, oh, these two books complement each other. They're very similar. They could not be more different. Whereas Olivia Lang is exploring the price of paradise and checking her own privilege, we have Jamaica Kincaid. Who writes? I then met my other traveling companions, the people who would make my journey through the Himalaya a pleasure. There was Cook, 
His real name was so difficult to pronounce. I could not do it then, and I cannot do it now. There was his assistant, but we called him Table. And I remember him now as Table because he carried the table and the four chairs on which we sat for breakfast and dinner. How's that sit with you? This is the image of a porter carrying a hundred pounds of their belongings up a mountain. A hundred pounds of their belongings on his back up a mountain. Jamaica writes how the porter reminds her so much of her 16 year old child. But then a few short pages later, she writes, what had the porters been doing all day? What had they been doing when we were exploring the landscape, looking for things that would grow in our garden, things that would give us pleasure, not only in their growing, but also with the satisfaction with which we could see them growing and remember seeing them alive in their place of origin. Remember that. A mountainside, a small village, a not easily acceptable place in the large still world. The porters should be fired. They were not being good porters. They should bend to our demands, among which was to make us comfortable when we wanted to be comfortable. So on page 162, when the porters refused to come back, you're just cheering on the porters. Oh, I stand corrected. The porter was not 16, he was 14. In general, I just found her insufferable. She seems very miserable. She doesn't seem to have any respect for the land or the people that she's visiting. Uh, even, I mean, <sighs> she bought a prayer rug that was made by a hand loom. And this is what she has to say about it. I bought one and only one. And after I got home to Vermont, did I see that it was somewhat crooked. It had not been evenly woven lady. And she really has a hard nut for the Germans. I don't think she's going to get any German fans with this book. She says on page 182, a group of Italians who had just returned from base camp there was camped nearby. There was also a group of Germans. As Americans and British people, we felt free to make fun of the Italians, but in a kind way. As Americans and British people, we not only made fun of the Germans, we also hated them. And then she has the gall and the nerve to end her book with this, the garden is an invention. The garden is an awareness, a self-consciousness, an artifice. One star, first of the year. I'm sad that trees had to die for this book to be printed. Jamaica Kincaid, done. I really hated that book, so I decided to pick up Ninth Ward and start reading that simultaneously just to break up my reading and to give me something that I was getting something out of because Jamaica was not delivering. Ninth Ward, I put on the TBR not only because it has a flower on the cover, but I wanted to participate in Middle Grade March, and this is a book written for young people. This is a book about a girl in Louisiana named Lanisha who is estranged from her family. She's being raised by a woman by the name of Mama Yaya. And Mama Yaya has visions. She can uh, foresee the future. And she sees a storm approaching. And that storm winds up being Hurricane Katrina. And this book did exactly what I needed it to do. It delivered on that front. I thought the character of Lanisha was a really interesting and complex character. She's a girl who, throughout the book, finds herself caught between two opposing worlds. And she's always longing for the other world while at the same time valuing and loving the life that she has. Uh, for example, her family that she's estranged from seems to be middle class, upper middle class living in the suburbs, but she loves her mama Yaya and the, the life that they've built together in the Ninth Ward, and when that's threatened, she would do anything to save it. I don't think I'm gonna surprise any of you or reveal any big spoilers when I tell you that the ending of the book is very action-packed. The author does dip their toe into what the response was uh, in regards to Hurricane Katrina's relief. I wish they had gone a little farther. I think there was a missed opportunity there, but this was a really enjoyable book. Nice little glimpse into Louisiana. Some of you might know that I've been reading Ally Smith's Seasonal Quartet, uh, which consists of autumn, winter, spring, and summer. This is the third book, Spring, 
And out of all of the books that I've read from this series, this is by far the most straightforward narrative book. The others have been very experimental. When I first started Autumn, I was like, whoa, I don't know if I'm smart enough to read this. But the thing about the other two books is the, the further you read, the more sense they start to make. So if you're interested in reading this series, don't give up if you're initially turned off. This book focuses a lot on the uh, era of Brexit and Trump, and it focuses a lot on immigration. There is a character who is having a really difficult time and is considering ending it all. And there is a mysterious girl who seems to have like almost Jedi Knight powers. And she crosses paths with a person who is working at a detention center and they cross paths with the dude who wants to end it all. And then they all wind up in an ice cream truck. Intrigued? I have really enjoyed this series and I'm glad that I didn't give up with Autumn. I'm glad I stuck with it. Allie Smith does a fantastic job of capturing that moment in time with the presidential election, with the pandemic, with Brexit, the feelings that people were feeling, the turmoil, the emotions, things that you just forgot and moved on. You're reading it and you're like, oh yeah, I remember when that happened. And that's crazy. And I can't believe that we lived through that. And now I get to tell you about my favorite book of the month. This book, <laughs> when I tell you it is so close to being a five-star read, it is ridiculous. I should just, I should probably go back and make it a five-star, but mm. let me just start off with a disclaimer and say that my taste in books can sometimes be rather dark. If you want to call it taste, especially with this book. I know that some of you who watch my weekly wrap up videos have started reading this book just because you saw how much I was enjoying it. Shout out to Happy Laundry, who said, and I think this captures the book perfectly, the sentences are beautifully written, but everything else is grotesque. So the premise is really simple. There's a patient in a hospital in Versailles who has to constantly be monitored because it's rumored that he has eaten a golden fork that is killing him amongst many other things. And when I say he has eaten really unbelievable things, that is the understatement of the year. And there are several gross out moments throughout the book. There is this nun who has been assigned to watch him and while she's sitting there killing time, he starts to tell her the story of his life. And it really is an unbelievable story. And it's so cinematic, I will be shocked if this is not adapted for either a movie or a miniseries. If they don't, it is such a missed opportunity. It was my initial thought when reading the book. I was just like, who would I cast? Who would I cast? Who would I cast? And maybe the craziest part of this whole book is in the afterword, the author tells us that the story is based on a French peasant who was born in 1772. Facts are stranger than fiction. If you've read the book Perfume or have seen the movie adaptation and enjoyed it, I think this is a book that you might gobble up. It's a new favorite of mine. The next book I read was The Waters by Bonnie Jo Campbell, another beautiful book cover that has fallen prey to Jenna Bush's reading club. This is a book that has so much potential. I would even say that uh, it almost tiptoes into like a, a Toni Morrison kind of vibe when it comes to world building and family matters and characters, that sort of thing. But it suffers from pacing. It is a very, very slow read. It is worth reading for sure, but it's definitely a character driven book, not a plot driven book. Um, there are moments in the story that will literally have you like <gasps> holding your breath, uh, especially if you're like me and you have a fear of snakes, whoo -hoo, buddy. But getting through this book, I found really challenging. And it was another case of me having to pick up another book in order to finish this one. It's just very long winded. And I feel like if there had been a little better editing, it would have been a four star, no question. It's also just literally a heavy book. If you see this in the bookstore, pick it up 
and you'll be surprised. It's hefty. And also, the print was very small, which might have influenced my reading experience. And during this time, I found myself in a real fatigue. I got caught up in the news cycle. I was slogging my way through the waters and I felt like I was approaching a reading slump and I did not want to end my month on that note considering what a wonderful month of reading I had had. You guys think I'm kidding about my apartment being filled with books and noise? Are you hearing this shit? So I did the same thing as before and I picked up another quick short read and this time it was my girl Olivia Lang who saved the day. I reread Crudo which is very similar to Ali Smith's series as far as that same world, same time period. Uh, she does a great job of capturing it and so does Olivia Lang. In fact, like five minutes after I had said, I don't wanna leave the house, I don't wanna do anything, I'm tired, I just, I wanna to go to bed, I feel asleep on my feet. I crack open the book and I read this. Kathy was becoming obsessed with the numbness, the way the news cycle was making her incapable of action, a beached somnolent well. And then she followed that up a few pages later with, I am just so tired and I felt seen. I said, you've got to pick yourself up. You've got to go bathe, get some clothes on, get out of this apartment, take care of business, go get a haircut, go do your groceries, go walk the dog, go do everything you need to do. Don't let all of this crap bog you down. So thank you, Olivia Lang, not only for writing an interesting book, I would say not as strong as her nonfiction, to be honest, uh, but thank you for getting me out of my apartment and into the world because you can fall into those wormholes and get lost. And the last book I read on my March TBR was Virginia Woolf's Orlando. I'm seeing a stage adaptation this coming week by Sarah Rule. Cannot wait to see what she does with the story. I saw the movie adaptation that stars Tilda Swinton and enjoyed that, but I wanted to read the original source material and I'm really glad I did. I've read a few books by Virginia Woolf, A Room of One's Own, and Mrs. Dalloway, I will say that she has a tendency to describe a lot and list a lot, and I don't have the attention span. Let's say that she talks about, I don't know, a, a, a vase, and she starts describing in detail the vase, and then she compares it to other things that are in the room, and it will go on for like a page, a page and a half, sometimes two pages, and by the time I'm done reading that, I have forgotten what she was talking about, and I get lost in the story. So that's my challenge in reading Virginia Woolf. So you can imagine my reading experience of Mrs. Dalloway. But um, it was going there in the first half of the book. I, my mind was wondering, I, was, I had to go back and reread. But once the major event of Orlando happens, and I don't wanna spoil it if you don't know what it is, because it's basically the entire setup of the book, her writing style changes. She, she doesn't, carry on about things as, as much. I am blown away by the fact that she wrote this book in 1928. It is so ahead of its time. It's about a character who transcends time and gender and poses questions that we as a society are just now starting to discuss. Um, so worth reading. There were so many passages in here that I took notes on. I just, I was blown away by the book. I think that it's a brilliant must read. It should be a five, but I'm difficult. As I was making my way through my TBR, a book that I put on hold at the library came in and that was Mona of the Manor, which is supposedly the last book in the Tales of the City series, which I read last year. I don't believe that this is the last book in the series. It seems like a very strange note to end the series on. To be honest, I felt like the book felt dated and unnecessary. I really don't see what it added to the series. There was some strange things that just didn't sit right with me that happened in the book. Most notably, there's a, a run-in with George Michaels and they name him 
George Michaels at a cruising spot. And just given his history and the fact that he's dead, that didn't sit right with me. And then throughout the series, characters do things that are very questionable and would land them on true crime TV and or prison. And we as the readers just kind of go, oh, it's a fun series and overlook it. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it was strange. There were four books that I didn't get to, just didn't have enough time. And those were A Passage to India by E.M. Forrester, Travels with My Aunt by Graham Greene, Magnolia Parks by Jess Hastings, and Twice Lost by Phyllis Paul. We shall meet again soon, just not this month. Ooh, that was Passage to India. So that's everything that I read. It was a total of 10 books, which is surprising. It's the second month in a row that I've read 10 books and I, I never read that amount before starting this channel. So I guess you guys are a good influence on me. I gotta say for a stack of books that were just randomly put together based on their cover art, there were some really good reads and I hope there were a few that you might add to your list. Let me know if you've read any of them. Uh, let me know especially if you have read any of the books that I didn't get to. Don't forget about Passage of India on the floor. Let me know which ones I should prioritize. And um, as always, you know what to do. Please be that algorithm. Um, I still don't understand how it works, but you guys are doing a good job, so keep it up. I hope that you had a really terrific month of reading. I feel like March was pretty solid and I'm pleased with the books that I read. And uh, I just wanna thank you all again so much for watching and for supporting the channel. Uh, I'm still kind of wrapping my brain around the fact that there are a thousand of you out there now. And um, just know that I read every comment and um, I have truly appreciated building these little online relationships with you. And nothing makes me happier than to hear that, hey, I picked up this book because, you know, you said that it's worth reading. And um, just know that there are many books that I have picked up for the same exact reason. So that's the reason I started the channel was to have this exchange and to learn about new great authors. So keep them coming. And I promise to do the same. Until next time, here's to April. Happy reading. Bye.